Hi everyone. Um, I'd like to present to you the artist Timotheus Angawan Kusno. Uh, let's give him a hand. Yeah. Um, so for, for before we get up later for the discussion, um, Timotheus is going to give us a, a tour of the exhibition. Um, so in the next 40 minutes or so, we just have Timotheus tell us what the work is all about. If anyone has any questions, um, there will be Q&A at the end of the tour, uh, but if there's anything that you want to prompt, if, if there's any questions you want to ask in the middle of it, please just raise your hand and wait for me to pass your microphone. Um, it's just for recording purposes, actually. Um, a microphone and then, you know, Timothy will be happy to answer your questions after. Yeah, so I'll hand it back to Timothy. Yes. Okay, hold on. Yes. Started? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so come and see, yeah. Well, Firstly, I would like to thank to Ilham and also to Han Efkens for making this happen. And yeah, I'm so happy to be here to share my work with you. And this is my very first uh, exhibition, solo exhibition in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. And <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to straight to the work. So yeah, so in the last 10 years, I've been working with this particular ideas on finding and questioning the lasting impact of, oh, of the colonialism and what's so called the shared history, which I believe it's also, it's not only about the, the let's say in Indonesia, it has this a connection between the Dutch colonization and Indonesia or back then the Dutch East Indies, but it's not only about that because this colonial uh, experience also happened all around the world. So it's not belong to this uh, particular region. And by this work, I try to invite all of us to reflect it back to our own baggage and to seek this lasting impact and then also to question it. And yeah, so this work, actually I, I situate this work as the introduction the introduction for the two video works that you are about to see, the reversal and terra incognita. The reversal and terra incognita, actually, it's part of the trilogy. And the third part of this uh, trilogy will be done, hopefully, in the 2025. And then, as an introduction of this work, actually, because yeah, I know that my work is very complex. So yeah, I need to have some kind of a complementary and then also some kind of a, a standing ground for, for the audience to go step by step into the works because later you will see the abstraction, all of my question here. And I'm happy because like with this uh, award, I can make this done uh, together with the communities in Imogiri, Yogyakarta, with the Jatilan Trans Dancer. So this work actually part of the universe of my work, which is so called Center for Tanar and Studies and the ritual Rampok Siluman Machan. And then this universe, this work, actually explore the interconnectedness between the colonialism and also how it merged and the marriage of the colonialism and the feudalism and how it has a long-term impact even after the fall of colonialism as a period of history, how it's being reproduced subtly, silently during the, let's say, the dictatorship and also after the post-dictatorship, how it has uh, the fabricated and also how it, uh, it circulates the logic that lies behind uh, this uh, operation of the violence and also extraction, the idea of developmentalism and growth. And particularly this uh, uh, video works, Phantoms, I use the entry points, I mean, I use the entry uh, point of this work by connecting the idea of ghosts that 
that is connected again with the dependency to sweetness and also the sugar industry that was introduced firstly during the colonial period. And uh, in this uh, painting, reproduce a painting from the colonial uh, governor general that actually uh, the original painting was stored in the Rijks Museum in the Netherlands. And the original painting was shipped back to the Netherlands after the Dutch recognized Indonesian sovereignty in 49 which Indonesia declared the proclamation in 45 after the the defeat, uh, after the, the Japan loss in the war and then why these spendings become so important uh, so to speak because back then this was I mean this were uh, hang in the governor general palace to to mark or to symbolize the continuity of the regime of the colonial government and then they try to to keep uh, the security of this painting so during the Japanese occupation some of the painting being hit uh, in like in the sugar industry in sugar factory and then in the Kodak Kodak factory if I'm not mistaken and then these were the very first items that were shipped back to the Netherlands and then I had an opportunity to work with this uh, original painting and frames uh, from 2019 to 2022 for the exhibition in the Rijks Museum, where I I have my statement to dismantle the monument because this was seen as the monument as the continuity of the, the colonial regime, and then by detaching the original painting from its frame, and instead of putting the painting on the wall. I put all of the frames scattered all around the floor as yeah it's, it's, it looks like cemetery with the name of the governor general and then the the painters and then again for this uh, introduction to get into the works I reproduce uh, the image but I rescale it down so uh, to decolonize and to dismantle this monumentality of these paintings and I bring up forward the background instead so the faces are gone because this also posed the question about this lasting impact but also the ghost of it the ghost of the colonialism the ghost of the coloniality and the modernity that brought by the coloniality but the colonialism that we are dealing on up until today for instance the idea of growth the idea of uh, developmentalism that keep the pace of our society racing super fast and now we we are dealing with this ecological grief so it has this long route back to the colonialism actually and against this wall then these three videos also uh, this work uh, expressing the idea the question about the rampok siluman machan and uh, <coughs> i'm sorry Chito? can i have water yeah. Sure. <laughs> sorry, sorry. So, <clears throat> the Rampok Siluman Machan is, a, is a, an investigation from the Center for Tanah Runjuk Studies. The, so, the Center for Tanah Runjuk Studies actually that's a fictional institution. So, I am using the fictional institution as as a medium to question about the institutionalization and knowledge production, which is bringing the colonial logic and mentalities back into the today's world after the colonial period, so to speak. So how it's keep regenerated throughout the institution and its apparatuses, let's say. I'm here I'm dealing with this documentary video, but also like in the other part of the exhibition, I exhibited the, the museum, the text, the academic text, also the ethnographical drawings, the photographs. So all of these apparatuses and all of these elements which embodied within the institutions being questioned. How this kind of uh, imageries and, and aspects, elements, taking part in, in shaping and in circulating this uh, colonial logic. Because the logic is something that is abstract, no? To, to, to touch it, to get into that logic, it's, it's not an easy way. So I need, uh, in, in, in my art practice, I'm using the, the storytelling as as the way to get there to, to question this. Thank you. Yeah. And then, so the Rambok Siluban Machan, 
is a made up story but it was inspired by the ritual the lost ritual in java called rampokan macan so in rampokan macan normally the feudal king would sit together with the colonial officer they would see the fighting they would see the fighting between the tigers versus the bulls and in this arena the thing that must happen is the death of the tiger because the tiger in this context in this ritual it represents the idea of evil the idea of demon the idea of of uh, disorder so in a way to create harmony and stability in the society this tiger had to be killed while in another hand in another context the tiger for Japanese people it symbolized the idea of ancestor the idea of a guardian angel or, or guardian spirit so in that sense there is a shifting shifted meaning and also there is this ambivalency uh, in the idea of tiger itself but for me what I want to what, what I want to pinpoint is the death of tiger it really strongly related to the idea of demonizing what so-called others in a way to create what so-called the harmony and stability tranquility and order peace and security or whatever the political rhetoric is that you can also find reflected to the idea in the second film Terra Incognita and here reflected is reflecting to the first film reversal so that's why this is this these two elements they are becoming a very uh, I mean uh, the key points for this introduction to get into the experience of reversal and terra incognita the mass violence that operated by the power structure in a way to get the, the harmony and stability and the ghost of the colonialism that is keep being reproduced subtly intangibly and then yeah I think the rest you can experience it yourself and then you can like uh, get into the details of this a video where I also work with some archives, some factual archives and also some fabricated archive. And then uh, shall we yeah, sure. get into the Screening room? Detail. Third room. The third room actually. Third room? Oh yeah. yeah. So yeah. Well, later maybe you can experience the whole two films but I would share a bit about this uh, last section of uh, this show. So the first section uh, considered it as a, as an introduction, and this is an open question. Uh, so in this section, it's an open question. It's an open ending. I put it as the index, the index that is related to the whole work, the whole uh, main project here, the whole video in reversal and terra incognita. So I'm talking a bit about the video. So in the video. Uh, as I'm talking about the remnants of sugar industries, you can see later on there are so many elements, so many like keywords that are pinpoint like the railroads and sugar plantation and then sugar factory and also if you see, if you notice there will be a villa that was once uh, owned by the, the owner of sugar industry and all of those elements, all of those places connected with the idea of ghosts because all of those places now considered as abandoned and as ghosts, uh, it's very ghostly, uh, anchor. So there are so many horror elements in it. When I encountered during my uh, artistic research, when I came into some of these places, normally I would, uh, I would have a discussion or conversation with the people nearby, with the neighborhood, and then most of them, the very first story that they shared were the ghost stories of these places, the ghost stories of this uh, sugar factory, the ghost stories of this villa. So I'm re I was really uh, fascinated by this idea of ghosts because it, it gives this blurry or the blind spot where actually so many things uh, colliding where the past can meet the embodied in the present, which metaphorically it's also represented in the tradition of Jatilan because in the state of trance the dancer become the medium as, as the dancer got possessed the dancer become the medium of the past let's say he got possessed by the the ancestral spirit and then 
in the body of the present, in the body that is now uh, of the dancer, this ancestral spirit has some idea or for or, or foresee some I, some picture of the future. So the colliding of this uh, future and then also the past in the present body, it shows also this unlinear concept of time, which is is pretty much in opposite with this linear concept of time that brought by the modernity, brought by the industrialization. And during the start of trends also, uh, there is uh, this fascinating uh, uh, phenomena that I saw because it deals with the unconscious state also. And then in this unconscious state, the dancer, they could talk anything. So the, the idea of disorder had its place, even it's in the temporary, in the temporariness uh, in this uh, performance. And, and then here, all of those index are being put, like the blurriness of the facts of the fiction and also the future. And here, some of the works I work with archive, the real archive, some other I work with the Center for Tanarunjuk Studies, so it has this fictional element uh, mixed with the archive. And some others, I post the question about the the rapid and radical growth of the machine learning algorithm. So you might notice or you might not notice that some of the works, even in the drawing itself, has the, let's say, the collaboration of me with the AI. So I mix the, the aircraft with the AI and the drawings and also the stories. And then not try to be deceptive, but this is the question that we are posing now, like this, this, this uh, existence of AI has brought some new layers into the future and the interpretation of history also that we are dealing on this. And I think you can uh, read it also in the disclaimer that the disclaimer itself was generated by the AI. So this gives this kind of meta-fictional reflection on where are we standing now and, and how we deal with all of these uh, complexities and enigma, I would say. And yeah, so enjoy and thanks for being here yeah you can ask a question some, also for okay cool if anyone has any questions for Timotis or anyone okay if no one has questions i have a question okay <laughs> uh, so um I, I see the, the Jatilan team is quite strong in both the films, mm -hmm. and, um, and you've spoken a bit about it, but I've, I'm also kind of curious um, and about the use of the Jatilan as a metaphor for your trying to say, and if you've also explored the ideas of Kuda Kepang that we have here, mm -hmm. which is kind of similar to Jatilan, Mm -hmm. um, but apparently, it's also a completely different thing mm -hmm. from Kodeke mm -hmm. um, because um, I've always thought that you know that Jatilan is just a version of Kodeke mm -hmm. or it's just what you call Kodeke in mm -hmm. in Java. But apparently, here in Malaysia, we also have Jatilan, mm -hmm. which is not Kodeke mm -hmm. um, have, have Have you actually also explored and looked at Kodeke yeah. in Malaysia? Oh, and in Malaysia, it's not not yet. But I would love to see Kuda Kepang and Jatilan in Malaysia for sure. But yeah, my very first encounter with this, with this particular uh, specific performance was also from Kuda Kepang. Because I was growing up in Sumatra Island in Bengkulu. I was growing up in this uh, very small kampung surrounded by the coffee plantation and forest. And they have Kuda Kepang and I was fascinated and amazed. I think I was around six years old if I'm not mistaken. Like, a f yeah, very little. Together with my friend, we saw this performance just like in the border of this, uh, between the sugar, f uh, not sugar, uh, the coffee plantation and the kampung. And then we saw men got possessed and then the complete chaos. And then, yeah, I had no idea, but there was a strong image in my mind. And then, yeah, and then I think I can recall it now why I want to work with this because it, it leaves so many questions, it leaves so uh, strong image in my head. And then, yeah, and luckily, like in, in, in Jogja, 
or in Java, there are so many groups of Koda Kepang in Kampung. Some of them now in the touristic kind of uh, purpose. Uh, some Koda Kepang being performed in the uh, not uh, not Koda, but some Jatilang being performed, and people act to be possessed, and then yeah, just got commodified for this uh, kind of uh, touristic uh, ideas and, and interest. But also some of this uh, performance, like I work with farmers. Normally they are farmers, but then also uh, Jatilan is the part of their culture. They used to move from Kampung to, to another and then they used to have this kind of performance when uh, someone gets circumcised or, or with someone uh, or during the wedding ceremonies or yes, or some, some family want to celebrate something. So they will have uh, the performance of, of Jatilan. And then the Jatilan that I work with, most of them during the pandemic, all of the performance were stopped and we had no ideas, we had no clue what is the future of the performance art of this uh, street performance. So, yeah, I'm lucky to have this uh, uh, commission, this award from Hanefkin so that I can work with the community uh, back then in Indonesia to, yeah, so let's make something, let's, let's move this to the screen instead because we cannot perform this because the, the performance stopped because I mean, it's part of their life, it's part of their culture. So for them having this process, it's, it's for me also, it's very relieving. It's, 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 it's very meaningful, I would say, because it was happened during the time of pandemic or when everything got so dark, no ideas of the future again, sorry to repeat this, but, but this is very emotional for me to, to work with them uh, and then I'm sorry if I'm talking a bit long, but I want, I want to share a bit about the process because uh, the process of working during this time of pandemic because, because back then the restriction of the gathering and lockdown really limiting people to, to do this uh, certain process. So for us, yeah, we took the jab and then we, 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 do, we did the notes and whom we met before so we we follow the restriction we follow this health control and then at the same time we we have this workshop like continuously with this uh, a very limited uh, people that we know in their place so it took like 90 to 90 minutes to two hours from my place by motorbike to get into their place so every day I, I ride my motorbike to their place and then we, we did this whole process together for sometimes like maybe around three weeks, if I'm not mistaken. It's, about, it's, it's kind of on and off, but yeah, in total it's around, uh, around three weeks. And then they allowed me to, sh to shoot some of the scene also in their sacred forest. So if you see the, the scene in the forest, in the film reversal, that's the, the forest nearby their area. It's sacred, so I was invited to join them, and then I did the rituals also. I did the offerings, the prayers, and also I need to take a bath in the springs. And then during the night, we did this uh, tumpengan. I don't know how you call it in English, but it's kind of a slametan, like a prayers for with certain kind of food, so that we wish everything gonna, yeah, gonna happen as it's planned. Yeah, and then, yeah, we we did all of this uh, process and rituals before finally uh, we shot all of the scene and the performance in this forest by their invitation. So for me to have this kind of engagement with the communities, to work and make this work together with the communities, it's, it's super valuable. And I plan to have the screening of this film actually later uh, this year together with these communities in the cinema. So uh, yeah, I'm thinking of inviting them uh, to this festival and then yeah, having them watching themselves performing and yeah, looking back at our process in the big screen together with these uh, communities. So I'm just curious, like when you're shooting the film, mm -hmm. the, the rituals were for real, like <coughs> you were shooting a an actual active ritual like and the performance we trans and all there are two parts yeah yeah so some parts when 
There are two parts, in terra incognita and in reversal. Yes, we we did shot the real performance, the real rituals, the whole uh, uh, the whole uh, trance situation uh, the, when the dancer got possessed in the documentary side of it. So we have this uh, this part also when we did the rehearsal. We did also the, the, the full rehearsal for the music and also for the, the performance. But for the, the film, well, so I'm, I'm talking a bit about the backstage of it also, because we have this logic of production. We have this time, we need to do this shot because we are involving like people from the kampung who, I mean, this is, this is not their primary job. They, they have things to do outside of this. So, we have to have this kind of uh, logic of production also here. And I was lucky to work with the, the professional actors, the professional uh, performers that can communicate also with them. It's like a casting coach, yeah, yeah uh, in, in uh, film-wise. So this also gives a space for, for the dancer to, to act to think and also to, to do the process in the logic of film production in that sense. To maintain the energy, okay, cut, we keep the energy there and then we need to do this and this, we need to, re, to do, change the angle a bit and then uh, we need to add up, so, and then okay, get back to that energy that we left in the last shot, let's do continue it. So yeah, so there are two approaches, first in the documentary approaches and then this, the second one, Yes, the, the fictional uh, narrative production approaches. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anyone? Yeah, sure. Right. Hang on. So the the lot. Of, uh, there are a lot of young people. I wonder if you could um, talk about the time that when you were in school and how colonial history was represented to you as a young Indonesian. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So when I was in school, I was I was a student under the curriculum that was established during the new order, during the dictatorship, uh, during the, the, yeah, the, the authoritarian regime. So the, the history came to me as something that, that was very solid and didactic, and it came as something that was monoverse. So the only version to see the past, to look back to our past, was the, the single version of history delivered by the ruling authority. But then I was surprised and I got this deep deconstructive experience on dealing with the history when I read Pramudi Anantatur and uh, Max Havlar Multatuli, where these two authors, so I owe so much from the world of literature. I owe so much. And yeah, uh, from uh, Multatuli, uh, uh, Max Havlar, and from Pramudi Anantatur's Tetralogy Pulau Buru. I learned that history was more than that. I mean, that was, I mean, historic, history as the narrative, it came to me like something that was completely intimate and put me as a human dealing with the past. I mean, like from, from my experience of reading Pramudia, Pramudia, he dragged me into this dilemma, this problematic, challenge of being an Indonesian in the time of colonial and it's not about something that is black and white because it's not about who's right or wrong but it's about this struggle it's about the struggle against this unknown power because we had no idea what was the colonialism was about this unknown power about this this ghost again and dealing with this is completely tragic yeah, colonialism was, I mean, yeah, to put it that word, a tragic. It was a tragic struggle. So I encountered history through the, the novel, through the literature that opened my eyes. Okay, then history as the narrative. His, this has its, its artistic value and artistic uh, elements on it. It's not something that is, that is very boring and cold as it was delivered in, uh, in my school class. So I keep questioning on the history then, and then I found out that, yeah, in a way of building the idea of history as the narrative, 
there is a fictional element in it. No? There is a fictional element in it in a way that why we pick this person, these subjects, and then put together with this event, why we select this event, and then uh, make a sequence about, uh, th with this perspective, and then, and then why we, we stitch it with this, uh, with this uh, another story of this person. And then, yeah, I mean, that formulation is, is pretty much uh, connected to the idea of uh, narrative making of uh, creating a fictional story also, I would say, of documentary. There is a part of editing. So the editing part, editing part plays an important role in making, in the sense of making the narrative. So in that sense, that's why my work's also dealing a lot with the idea of editing of the uh, storytelling structure and also of creating sequences and montage, which I pretty much uh, learned from uh, the logic of editing uh, the moving image. So that's how it's all connected. Yes, hi. Hey, Timotheus, I, I completely agree with you when you say that the history of colonialism is tragic and the echoes of that tragedy are still felt nowadays. It's tragic for the people from Indonesia who saw their culture ripped apart. It's also tragic for the Indonesians that were born out of uh, marriages between Indonesians and Dutch because they were not seen by other Indonesians as Indonesians and they were definitely not seen by the Dutch as Dutch. The color of their skin was yeah. too dark yeah. to be seen as Dutch and they were really looked down upon. Yeah. So these people grew up in this kind of in-between yeah. land, between not belonging anywhere. Yeah. And then, of course, after independence, after the war, really, because you mentioned yeah. that uh, Indonesia was proclaimed independent in 1945 after the Japanese were defeated, yeah. but that the Dutch felt that they had to hold on to their colony. And they brought soldiers over to fight. This was an incredibly tragic happening also because so many of these soldiers had no idea why they went. They had been in the war from 1940 to 45, and so a young man, 18, 20 years old, and they were just so eager to go out of the country. So they enlisted just for the adventure, just to be away, and then they found themselves in Indonesia, a country they didn't know, and they were told to do things that they feel they were unspeakable, really, unspeakable, and that changed their lives. When I say unspeakable, I mean it's unspeakable what has happened, but it was also unspeakable for them to talk about that later. So this was something they kept inside. The people who were born from the Indonesian and Dutch marriages who suffered this discrimination in Indonesia had to leave the country and come to the Netherlands, where they were also looked down upon. So they somehow felt that they were going back to the motherland, as it were, even though they'd never been there. And they were looked upon as something very strange. They were put in, sometimes even in former concentration camps. Um, and it was very important for the Dutch that they integrated. And one of the ways to check that was to see if they would eat at least three times a week potatoes, and not only rice. So this is, this is tragic, you know, yeah. particularly because the Dutch potatoes aren't very good anyway. And I much prefer nasi goreng, but just, you know, <laughs> to have such an important part of your culture being questioned and, and being looked down upon. But these people who had suffered such tragedy, because they'd also been in Japanese concentration yes. camps for several yes. years, uh, where again they were put in this position that they weren't on the same level as the Dutch, so they were also separate there as yeah. well. They, so they always felt left out, and they always felt looked down upon, and then they came to Holland, this cold and chilly country, where again they were looked down upon. But I feel it's very much in the Asian nature to adapt to any situation. So they never complained, and they just got on with it and tried to make the best of it. But the feelings were there. Yeah. And the feelings were transmitted to their children. And I know several of them. And they are actually looking for their identity. They want to know what their parents went through. And they want to know where they came from, as it were. And I think it's only very recently that the Dutch are acknowledging the 
tr truth of their past there, uh, right? Yeah. Including the exhibition you, you were formed part of. This was the first exhibition yeah. where uh, the presence of the Dutch in Indonesia was in Kabang in a critical way, according mm -hmm. to some, not even critically enough. That was the same time <coughs> when a book came out by a Belgian writer, I don't know if you read it, I think it was called Revolution. Revolution. Yeah, and that had a completely different look on the presence of the Dutch in, in Indonesia, and that was a hard pill to swallow for many, many Dutch. Yeah. You know, when you talk about um, literature and how important it is, I remember that when I was young, a long time ago, I have to admit, uh, I would read Hella Hase, and I would read Dutch writers who were born in Indonesia during the time of colonialism in the 30s. And they would describe this paradise where they lived, these wonderful houses with these gardens, and they wrote about their love for their babus, and, and yeah. how that paradise was taken away from them. But that's, oh, this is the vision I grew up with, you know? Paradise was taken away from the Dutch. Mm. And that is really, obviously, one side of it, and a very small yeah. side of it. I know that in Uruk, Hela Haas's book, she talked about her friendship with an Indonesian boy, and how that, in a sense, was impossible, that they, they could never meet. And I think that was really um, very symbolic for, for what happened at the time. So I must say that I'm very touched that uh, we are here now, you and I, yeah. coming from such different ways. And when you talk about when you were six years old from the Kampong and you saw what's happening. When I was six years old, I lived in the suburb of Rotterdam and I heard these wonderful stories about Tempo Dulu. Oh. You know, the, yeah. the years, the wonderful years in Indonesia that were no longer there. And now we're meeting and you're telling me and all of us a different story. So thank you very much. Oh. Thanks for sharing the story, Han. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess if there's no more questions, um, uh, is there one more question? Sure. Yeah, Hi, one. Hi. Yeah. Um, could you just share with us, let's say, um, looking at the works in front at the wall, notice there are quite a lot of different artworks. Uh, some of it are drawing, some of it painting, some of it are photos, yeah. um, some of it colored, and some black and white, uh, some of it is animation also. Yeah, yeah. So how does this relate to the question you're asking? And why are these um, arranged this way? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. Well, again, it, this uh, this image is situated as the index, actually. So every detail of this element actually has a connection to the two videos in reversal and terra incognita. Even though it seems disconnected, but in fact, like this rust and order, you see this work. Actually, this was the, the kind of rhetoric that being used uh, to, like I said in the earlier uh, uh, section of this exhibition, the idea of tranquility and order, and how this idea of tranquility and order uh, brought up by the, the ruling power in order to disciplinize and put up violence on people for the sake of the stability. But for whose stability? For whose peace? And for the for whose paradise again to connect it with the uh, with the Han uh, stories? So this kind of uh, jargon and also the idea of tiger because the tiger being uh, being the symbol of the other, like in the previous uh, uh, section, the rampokan siluman macan, it has this connection as the index, like in the at, at the end of the book, you can always connect it the, to words inside uh, the book in the previous pages. And then to see this as a whole and to get into this work through the disclaimer, it wrap all of this uh, question that seems disconnected, seems, seems uh, scattered, but in fact, yeah, as an abstraction, it resonates with this uh, question that I brought through this uh, video. If you see the terra incognita, also there, uh, to give you a bit, uh, uh, a bit uh, picture of it, uh, spoiler, spoiler alert. So, yeah, I'm I'm working in uh, with the with the anonymous and try to intervene and try to bring up across the memory and try to intervene the memory and to navigate the memory into this uh, ideal rhetoric of uh, 
social and justice, people's justice. So the changing of the uh, rhetoric, the changing of the words slightly little, little by little by the presence of the director as the power in this structure of uh, moving image production, which at the end, it was bounced back to the idea of tranquility and order, uh, peace and order, uh, security uh, and peace, the rules and order, then it just give a sense and uh, uh, give this uh, experience how the power subtly works to navigate the, yeah, the ideas of the people also. Yeah, the ideology, yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Timothy. Um, thank you.